Hey there, Math 2403. Welcome back. Unit number three, video one. Today we're talking about discrete probability distributions, and we will also enjoy the topic of expected value. Discrete probability distributions allow us to combine what we know so far in the course. We'll combine topics from discrete distributions, or basically descriptive statistics, and our probability topic from the last unit. So it's a, it's a nice unit because it's kind of comprehensive. We're basically uh, extending things that we already know. So let's get right to it. Before we talk about a discrete probability distribution, we have to define what a random variable is. And a random variable is basically just the result of an experiment. It's a numeric result. I, I looked up a few different definitions of that thing and I copied the one from uh, the textbook that used to run with this course. And it's kind of funny that they use the, the word uh, <laughs> variable basically to define what a variable is. <laughs> uh, but basically it's just the result of an experiment. So say we could do an experiment to see how long it takes to uh, survey a building site. So we go to a building site, we start our stopwatch, we survey it, we stop our stopwatch. That's how long it took to survey that particular site. And we could go from site to site collecting data. That's a random variable. I don't know how long it's going to take at each site. Uh, the length of time that it does take will have some sort of probability. Sometimes it won't take very long. Sometimes it will take very long. The probability of it taking very long might be low. The probability of it not or taking sort of a normal length of time might be relatively high. So we'll, we'll basically link probability to those outcomes. We could also look at another random variable here where I ask groups of six building technologists if they know anything about heat pumps. So I randomly pick six students and say, hey, what do you know about heat pumps? And maybe in a group of six, three of them knew something about heat pumps. Or maybe in another group of six, only one person knew something about heat pumps. And in another group of six, maybe no one knew anything about heat pumps. So those are my outcomes. And each of those things have probabilities associated with them. The probability that no one in a group of six knows something about a heat pump might be relatively high if you know, you're new to the program. Or if you just were talking about heat pumps in one of your core courses, well, then you might say the probability of getting six out of six would be very high. So it's something that has a random element to it. I did two examples here. One was measuring time, and the other one was basically counting. In the time case, we call that a continuous random variable, where you're, you, there's an infinite number of outcomes. It might take me one minute to survey the building site, or it might take me 10,000 minutes to survey it. And there's an infinite number of outcomes in between those two uh, because we're on a continuous scale. In my building technologists and their knowledge of heat pumps example, we call that a discrete case or a discrete random variable because we're counting. You can have zero out of six successes or you could have four out of six successes, but you can't have 3.23 people know something about heat pumps. So that's the difference between discrete and continuous. And we'll be discussing only the discrete case in this particular lecture. In the future, we will move on to the continuous case. So diving into this discrete case, we're going to link, like I said, probability to each of the outcomes. That's what cre creates this probability distribution. So 
we are really combining our first few units of the course and studying it as one. Here's that heat pump example. I have, I randomly pick groups of six building technologists and I ask them, do you know stuff about heat pumps? And sometimes no one knows anything about heat pumps. And that occurred roughly 26% of the time when I did my survey. I surveyed groups of six, sometimes three out of six knew something about heat pumps. That only happened 8% of the time. And when I did my survey, sometimes five out of six knew something about heat pumps. It was 0.2% of the time. And when I did my survey, never did I see a group of six where all six knew something about heat pumps. So I wrote this little plus sign there. I didn't, I, I just wanted to make you aware that, you know, we talked about probability axioms. And if I just written zero there, it might give the impression that there was, it was impossible to ever have six out of six. And I'm not saying that here. I'm just saying that in the, in my experiment, it didn't happen, but I'm not saying it couldn't happen. And that's why I put the little plus there. I think I could have just written 0 0.000, and we would know that to mean to three sig figs it was zero, but it wasn't necessarily impossible. But I just put the plus there to remind me to talk about that for a second. So I did, I kept track of all the possibilities. This is everything that can happen. Zero out of six, one out of six, two out of six, up to six out of six. And these are their associated probabilities. If I add all these probabilities up, I have to get 100% because these are the only possibilities. So these things have to cover everything that could happen. You can make a distribution, you know, rather than just going from a relative frequency chart, you can create a probability histogram. Basically, I list all the outcomes on the x-axis, I put probability on the y-axis, and then I make a bar chart. It's a histogram, I guess, because there's no gaps in between. That's the difference between it and a bar chart, and I have numeric data. So we can now see that there is a shape, and that's what distribution means. We're studying the shapes of probability, basically. Uh, we can see in this case that this data appears to be skewed a little bit to the right. You know, most of our data fell in the first few categories. When we were studying descriptive statistics, we, other st we also studied other properties of these graphs. We looked to see, you know, where is the approximate middle? You know, what's the mean of this probability distribution? I'd guess it's around one. You know, most of my data seems to clump there. And, you know, there aren't many values up here. It might be a little bit bigger than one, maybe, because of these, you know, possible cases of three, four, or five. So I can kind of estimate the mean just by looking at this. We'd also like to maybe study how spread out this is by coming up with a way to evaluate standard deviation. So this is kind of nice. We're, we're com combining probability with descriptive stats. We're supposed to take a pause here for a second and also notice that there's a relationship between probability and area. The, basically, the probability of zero outcomes is the area of this rectangle. The probability of two outcomes is the area of this rectangle. So probability and area are nicely linked because all of these things have a width of one. So it's just one times its height. We will 
utilize the fact that probability and area are linked uh, even in more detail when we get to the continuous case. Some rules of probability distribution. We already talked about this one. If you add up all your probabilities, you have to get a total of one because you've, you've essentially covered every possible outcome that could happen. And again, as we always have with probability, your, your probabilities have to all be between zero and one. We talked about finding the middle of a probability distribution, the mean. We'll even use the same notation that we've used before, mu. We often give it a special name when we're talking about the mean in a probability distribution context. We'll often refer to it as the expected value. What do you expect to happen if you randomly pick six building technologist students and ask them if they know something about heat pumps. How many of them would you expect to know something about it? Well, in our graph, it looks like it's around one. This is the most likely thing that happens, and my data is pretty close to that value. We can actually calculate the mean. It's just a weighted average. It's the sum of each outcome times its probability. Basically the same formula that you've used your whole life to calculate your grades. If you wanna find what your average is in the course, you take your midterm score and you multiply by the weight that the midterm is worth in the course. And then you add that to your final exam score times the weight of the final exam in the course. And then you take your quiz score and you multiply that by the weight of the quiz in this course, and then you add it all together. So this is not really a new formula. This is something you've, you've done weighted averages uh, <laughs> forever. So we just now have the new term expected value. The variance is your average distance away from the mean. So basically, you take your distances away from the mean each outcome minus the mean, you square it to make it positive, and then you weight it with its probability. So it's a weighted average distance of, the <laughs> of each point from the mean. There are two versions of the formula here. The first one's actually easier to calculate if you're doing these things by hand. So you might use that one more frequently than the second one. But the second one looks a lot like our, our formula that we had when we were talking about variance in uh, descriptive stats. Of course, we can take the square root of this and get the standard deviation, which is an even better or more applicable uh, statistic in most cases. In my building technologist example, we can actually calculate these things. I just recopied the data that we had. This is what was plotted. To calculate the mean, the mean is the sum of each outcome times its probability. So I need to multiply each outcome times its probability. So this value right here is just 0 times 0.262. And this value right here is 4 times 0 0.015. And you have to do it for all of them. So these are all the products of x and their weight or probability. Now we add this column up, and that's our mean. So the average is 1.2. I have it written here. If I randomly pick a group of six building technologists and then survey them, do you know stuff about heat pumps? On average, I'd expect 1.2 of them to, to know something about heat pumps. Now, obviously, you can't have 1.2 in a discrete situation, but I don't mind writing that extra decimal place there in my uh, measurement for the mean. Because I think it does add information. 
I know that it's closer to one than to two. Uh, and here's the number before it was rounded. The reason I wanted to keep that is that you can you use the mu in your calculation of variance. Looking back at our, our picture, scroll back a little bit, it does make sense, you know, that the mean is around there, 1.2. So we were, that's what we guessed when we were just sort of looking at this thing. And now the calculation agrees. We can calculate the variance as well. Uh, in order to do that, it's the, looking at the formula just above, it's the sum of your x's squared times their probabilities. And then after you've added those all up, you subtract the mean squared. So in order to solve this, I needed to make a new column here. I just squared all my x's, and then I multiplied them by the probability column. So this 0.24 right here is just uh, 16 times 0.015. And that's how, and we had to do it for all of them. You can tell that I used Excel to build this table. There isn't like a nice little shortcut formula in Excel uh, that will calculate the mean and variance for you. So you're going to have to sort of build these tables when you want the mean and variance of a probability distribution. Uh, for this one, we can just substitute now into this formula. If we sum this column up, that's 2.405. That's this part of the equation. And then we subtract the mean that we had from before, 1.201, but we square it. And then after we calculate that, we're gonna take the square root of it. So you get 0 0.963, which you know, to one decimal place anyway is 1.0. And again, the units are the same as the data. So these are, you know, building technology students. We can take the square root of this to get the standard deviation. And you get 0 0.981, which is also, you know, 1.0. So the average distance away from the mean is 1 which is a measure of how spread out our values are. And if we go back and look at our picture, that seems kind of reasonable. If you go one standard deviation to the right and one standard deviation to the left, you've basically covered a pretty good proportion of your data. If you go two standard deviations either way of your mean, now there isn't much left. If you go three standard deviations of your mean, now there's almost nothing left. So this will allow us to go back to our discussions about the empirical rule and Chebyshev's theorem. In this case, our data doesn't seem very bell-shaped, so we probably shouldn't really apply the empirical rule. We should probably discuss this using Chebyshev's theorem uh, because of that skewness. Remember, Chebyshev's theorem applies to any shape. So these calculations are a bit of a pain to do, but when you have a spreadsheet, it's not bad. Uh, you just build little custom formulas here, you know, that are the products, and then you can copy them down. Doing our continuing with our little example. Uh, what's the probability that, or is it unusual to find three people that know something about heat pumps 
in a group of six building techniques? It's a, the question. And remember, we use that sort of rule. If we use the empirical, we would say we'd go from minus 2 up to 2 for our z scores. when we had bell curves. And when we had something that wasn't a bell curve, we used Chebyshev. And then we, in order to decide if something was typical or not typical, we were a little more conservative and we widened it out to three standard deviation. That's when we have unknown shape. Or we know that it's not a bell. These are our criteria for, you know, our usual results. Usual Z scores will fall in these ranges. Since we don't have a bell curve here, I don't think we should use uh, what I mentioned up above here in the notes, you know, more than two standard deviations above or below the mean. I think we should just calculate the z-score and see if it meets the Chebyshev criteria. You may recall the formula for z-score. It's your score minus the mean over the standard deviation. In this case, we're talking about three. That's our x. Our mean was 1.201, if I recall, and our standard deviation was 0.9, I forget, 9.8, I think, 0.981. Notice I'm using extra sig figs there in this intermediate calculation, and then maybe we'll round this Z score off. I get 1.8. Remember, Z scores don't have any units. So three standard de or an outcome of three is 1.8 standard deviations above the mean. It's positive. So it's not unusual by either criteria. It's within two if it were a bell curve, and it's certainly within three because in this case we know it's not a bell curve. So I would say our conclusion here is no. An outcome of three is not unusual as it is within three sigma of the mean. Some people might have tried to answer this question just by looking at the probability. Um, let's go back and look at our table. The probability of 3 was about 8%. So that isn't super unusual. Usually we start to declare things as unusual once they get below 5%. So we can see that 4 is starting to be unusual, and 5 is an unusual outcome, but 3 not so much. So it agrees with both of the ways that we've discussed that sort of criteria. So really, we haven't done anything new. We've talked about probability, we've talked about Chebyshev's theorem, we've talked about the empirical uh, rule. All these things we've discussed before, just in slightly different contexts. So this is a you know nice review in a way. I think <laughs> we should maybe just call it there and call that uh, a good introduction to discrete distributions. In the next lecture, I think we'll, we'll move on to this binomial distribution, which is a special case. It's a specific discrete probability distribution. So let's keep this one short.
and take it from there next time. Take care. And have